Good morning. Welcome to Griffin Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Barry Vaughn. You're actually here inside of Griffin Baptist right now in my office. I'm so glad to have you here. I'm so glad that the Word of God has found you and laid you a captive this morning to it. And I pray that uh, you'll be spiritually fed and you'll be edified and nourished and convicted and comforted and afflicted and all the things that we all need um, every day. I pray that you'll find that here whenever you're finding it, wherever you're finding it. If you would, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. While you're getting there, let me um, tell you a couple things. First of all, for those who are members of of this church, I hope that you got your 40-day prayer guide in the mail. I also hope that um, you're ready for Fall Festival, which is right around the corner. It'll be here before we know it. If you want to work a table at Fall Festival, please get in contact with Laura McLean to do that and that'll be on a Saturday October 31st there's an advertisement we put up about this at the beginning of this video so you can go back to that at the end of it just go all the way back to the beginning and you see that advertisement for any more information and this Tuesday Griffin Baptist Church will be giving a special love offering really to Ambler Elementary School we are taking up a love offering to buy each one of those teachers and the staff up there a cup of coffee from Coyote Coffee. So we're getting to help a local business and we're getting to bless these teachers. Normally we would give them food, cakes, pastries, uh, but the times that we live in with COVID still going around, uh, just not able to do that. So based on a, a good sound request by a staff member up there, we're gonna buy them teachers coffee and bless them for all that they do. I got to speak to so many of you this week and it was such a blessing to speak to so many of you and it was such a blessing to hear how many of you were so thankful of the ways that we were doing things at this time in the church, keeping everyone safe. And I, it, those are just encouraging things to hear. I wanna thank you for your kind words and your love. Thank you so much. Let's go to the word of God this morning. Let's go to Matthew chapter five. We're gonna read verses one through four. We're gonna continue on with the Beatitudes. And seeing the multitudes, he went up unto a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And verse 4, our verse for this morning. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Father, thank you for yourself. Thank you that you've given so much to us, namely you, Lord, your holy God, your merciful God, your just God. We thank you for everything that you are to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your abundant blessing toward us as your people. You're so much better to us every second of the day than any of us deserve. And we acknowledge that. We acknowledge our sinfulness, Lord. We acknowledge your holiness. Father, continue to conquer sin in our lives. Continue to mortify it. Continue to make us holy, sanctified people. And Lord, we do look forward to that glorious day where we're done with this body of sin and we'll be glorified. We're ready for that day when that thorn in our flesh will be taken taken away. And we can be perfectly in the image that you've created us to be. Um, before the fall. Lord, we so look forward to this. Father, I pray for all those listening to this message this morning. I pray that you would work through the many flaws I have in communication and in myself, Lord, and that you would allow me to just make your word clearly understood, clearly perceived, Lord. And I pray that even they wouldn't just be clearly understood, but that your spirit would be at work in it, through it, and all around it for the hearers, so that they may be pierced through with the sword of the Spirit, Lord, this morning. They may be people that could mourn over their sin and be comforted. Father, be with us now as we seek your word and its meaning. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. So the Beatitudes this morning find us looking at something is difficult. We're going to look at at mourning. You know, we live in a culture right now that is not comfortable with mourning at all. In fact, I would say that we mourn mourning. Our day puts a premium on laughter, not on bellowing. And it puts a premium on smiles, not frowns. In this beatitude, Jesus points to mourning being godly. You need to be ready to examine yourself this morning. Even in scripture, we never read of Jesus laughing. 
Now, that's not to say he never did laugh. That would be a logical fallacy It'd be to make an argument based on silence. We're not saying that this morning, but you never read of it. It was not important enough to mention. But we read of him mourning and crying constantly. And you even see in the Old Testament he was prophesied to be the man of many sorrows. His disciples write in their epistles of even, for us as Christians, the serious nature of the inner life of a Christian. A very serious nature. Christ is making his followers kings, not clowns, and he's making us sheep, not hyenas. Mourning is essential. It is an essential aspect to entering and continuing on in the kingdom of God. And you see that in the beatitude this morning. It's not optional. It's not trivial. Mourning is for the godly, the repentant, for the spiritual. Do you hear me? Godly sorrow has never, not once, And the Spirit of God, has it ever been a wasted emotion? Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 2, Solomon says, what? It is better to be in the house of mourning than the house of feasting. And then one verse later, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 3, what does Ecclesiastes, what does he say there? Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sad countenance hath the heart been made better. Now that's Solomon saying that. The man who mourns has hit a great truth. Solomon's point in Ecclesiastes, and need I remind you, aside from Christ himself, Solomon is said to be the wisest man to ever live. This is an immense wisdom. It's just like we're reading here in the Beatitudes. It may seem backwards from our culture and our day and the way we think. How could could crying be be better than laughing? How could this be? This is wisdom. This is wisdom. It's pushing up against us this morning. Solomon's point in Ecclesiastes is that through death, Solomon says that we find some of these wisdoms. We find the wisdom of our finite nature, our creaturely nature. We find our temporal nature in such wisdom as looking at these things. We find that the wages of a life of sin is what? Death. Solomon sees funerals as great classrooms. That's what Solomon sees. And he sees mourning as a great schoolmaster for the inner saint of the inner soul of the saint. And so in the text this morning, it finds us not so much talking about mourning over the death of loved ones. While there is comfort given by God for that, for sure in Scripture, this is not what it's talking about here in this beatitude. So the context finds its meaning in everything that precedes it and everything that's around it. So it finds its context in what we just looked at last week finds its context in the beatitude of bankruptcy. The spiritual nature of this morning is directly related to how a person is broken in light of their poverty of spirit. This is what it's connected to. This is, this is the context. It's connected to our seeing and mourning our beggarly state, the very beggarly state of our soul, the deep debt of our depravity. This all drives a person to mourn. I remember when, when I got saved, I remember I was sitting outside and I was thinking and looking around. The Spirit of God laid hold of me and I became keenly aware of my sin and I experienced great fear and sorrow over it. This should be something every Christian testimony has in common. Let me tell you something. This is important. Mourning is important. Me telling you this is important. This is my job. A minister does not exist to debate wall colors with people. We don't exist for that. Pastors don't exist to make sure families are having fun. You give me a scripture. Give me chapter and verse for that sort of hedonism. It's not in the, it's not in the scriptures. We don't exist to debate trivialities or nitpick over words. In fact, scripture tells us not to quibble over words. We exist as tools of the Holy Spirit through the word of God to shepherd the people of God From here to there. From this city to the next city. From this life to eternal life. Look, me, myself, I don't know what some churches are used to, but for me, at least, I'm not a payroll prophet. I'm not a payroll prophet. It seems like a lot of churches these days in the West want to make a pastor a payroll prophet. And we'll put him on our payroll and we'll pay him. And so then we'll be able to control him. And he'll do my bidding and he'll speak my thoughts and he'll support my opinions. I am not that man. (laughs) I am not that man. Look, as a pastor, we are tools. And if a pastor is listening this morning, you listen to me, pastor. You're a tool of sanctification, of edification, of discipline and discipleship and godly guidance fenced off at the word. 
This is us. This is what we do. We aren't comedians, building managers, or club presidents. You have something far more important that you're called to than that. Pastors, we should be a vehicle for mourning. Let me ask you, what causes you to mourn this morning, Christian? Is it 2020? We're all mourning over something of 2020. Is it 2020, though, and all the worldliness that you've lost? Or is it 2020 and all the sin that's brought this judgment about? Which one is it? What causes your mourning? Is it your inability to sit where you want to sit? Or is it your inability to hopefully stop committing the sins that you're supposed to hate? Which one is it? Which one? Are you finding comfort in the material or in the spiritual? In the temporal or in the eternal? You can't be at both of these tables at one time. Come to the table of mourning this morning. Come there with me. Come there with us. What does Jesus mean by mourning here in this text, though, I wonder? You're reading this text. This should be a question that you have. What does he mean by it? There are nine different Greek words for this one word mourning in the English. There's nine different ones in the Greek, and they create this sort of spectrum of different degrees of mourning, from the mild to the most intense This one that Jesus uses here is the most extreme form of it. The most extreme, sorrowful, grief-driven form of mourning. It sort of pictures this intense pain of personal loss of a loved one, a spouse, a parent, a child. This intense pain. You can imagine, remember Jacob when he thought Joseph had been killed. You remember the intense pain that that Jacob had as he drove him to the dirt and he just smeared ashes all over him. He bellowed out and he cried from his gut. It's a grief that comes from information that we find out. It completely breaks an individual down. It shatters their hearts and minds. It produces tears upon their cheeks every single time. It brings their knees to the dust and it causes the proud head to bow and to hang low. Jesus is saying that the kingdom Those who are saved enter it this way. This is what he's saying. This is how you enter the kingdom. Broken, sad, and tearful. And mourning. Over what though? What are we mourning over? Sin. And our sinful state. This is how we enter. You don't strut into the kingdom. You don't just poke that chest out and throw them shoulders back and just strut into the kingdom. You crawl into it. You crawl into this. You don't just come in with a proud head raised. You come in with a humble head bowed. You don't just come in laughing lightly. You come in mourning. Scriptures are clear. This may seem backwards to you, but this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. You may say, well, I was saved when I was five years old. Preacher, listen, I I was saved when I was five. I went to a Billy Graham revival when I was five years old, and I got saved. But I never mourned sin a day in my life. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's why you've never been saved. That's why you've never been saved. Because Jesus taught salvation was like this. As a minister, this is exactly what I look for and I examine when talking to people about salvation. It's it's not just some sort of light smile and laughter. and Hey, I just want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want to make Jesus God. Can I get baptized? Where is the grieving? Where is the mourning? Where is the tearfulness over sins committed against this God that you supposedly love? This is not a game. This is not a game. This is not a feel-good exercise. What makes sin so awful? What makes it so awful? Why, Why is it something we should mourn over? You know, we look at the text where Jesus is dying on the cross and to think, you know, our culture has this really sort of physical view of pain and grief and everything we forget that the biggest painful experience the largest the most intense painful experience that christ experienced on the cross was becoming sin becoming sin on our behalf and then being treated that way by the rest of the trinity and we think how could that be more painful than crucifixion you know our very questioning of how that could be more painful to christ his very the very fact that you see him grieving over it the night before in the garden this is what he's struggling with it's not a roman whip or a roman nail or a roman tree it is becoming sin 
It is so contrary to his character, so contrary to his very nature eternally, something so contrary to him, the very thought of it is painful. The very thought of it. We're so comfortable with it, we don't understand how it could be painful. This is a problem for you and I. So let's stop and let's look. Let's think about what makes sin so terrible. Let me ask you some questions so we can flesh this out. What makes Satan so awful? Sin. What found, what has turned angels into demons? Sin. What has brought the thorns from the ground? Sin. What killed every single prophet of God that you've ever read about? Sin. What has caused every failed marriage? Sin. What about every church split and church critic that tries to tear a church apart? Sin. How about every broken relationship? What does that all broken relationships have in common? Sin. How about every abandonment? Sin. What has caused every death on this ball? Sin. What caused even the very betrayal of the most loyal, worthy being in existence, namely God? Sin. What caused the blood of God to fall and puddle upon the ground? Sin. It has torn apart every nation. It has damned and hurt every single person. It is enslaved by nature every single human being. And it has destroyed angels and will eternally destroy and damn men. And you engage in this practice daily in thought, word, and deed. And you think this may be nothing to mourn over? You may be deeper in it than anybody. Sadly, the church right now in the West, though, like Pharaoh... It hates the plagues, totally hates the plagues, but not the sin that causes it. it what this church in the West wants to return to normal comfort, but could care less about the discomfort of holiness that we're called to as Christians. Take an excursion with me in your text. I never tell Kent about these excursions, by the way. I like them to catch him off guard too, so he's got something fresh on Sunday mornings that he can enjoy. Take an excursion with me to Luke chapter 7. This is a lot of reading here, so I want you to be able to go back and read over this and think about it on your own time. But Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50, I think you'll recognize that account of Jesus in the house of Simon the Pharisee. He's there, dining, having a good evening, conversing with one of his enemies, and then in comes this sinful woman. And this sinful woman comes bringing a gift of oil. She falls down at the feet of Christ with tears, literally drenching his feet in tears, wiping her hair, which is the glory of a woman, wiping his feet with her hair. You see that. And then Dot, and then Simon is questioning this whole thing and saying, if he was a prophet, he'd know who was touching him. You remember. And Jesus tells the woman to get up and go in peace. Let's, let's examine this. Let's examine this. Because like I showed you last week in our, look, in our looking at being poor in spirit, this isn't just a one-off in the ministry of Jesus. And this mourning that we have in spirit is not just a one-off teaching here. So let's look at this. This is a woman whose reputation precedes her. She is known for her sin far and wide. Simon knows exactly who she is. And how does she come to Jesus? How does she come to him? Does she run and jump in his arms and wrap her legs around his waist? No. Jesus is not her boyfriend. You listen to me, women. Jesus is not your boyfriend. She doesn't even come to him like this. Does she come proudly, chest poked out, shoulders threw back, strutting up to him? Hey, Jesus. Hand extended, shaking his hand. Hey, how are you doing? My, my name my name is Barry. How are you? No. You listen to me, men. This is not a business transaction. You don't even have anything to offer. You're not a businessman with anything to offer, and he's not a businessman either. He doesn't come in this. She doesn't even come in this way to him. Does she just come to him lightly, jokingly, say, "Hey, Jesus, good to meet you. Let me tell you this joke I heard recently." No. Does she come to him angrily? No. How then does she come to him? She brings perfume that would have cost a year's wages, a very expensive gift to pour on him. She brings herself as well, and she brings herself low to his feet, very clearly in the Greek, the text 
alludes to that. She is down on the ground at his feet. May I say the Lord has never crushed a single soul that has ever been found at his feet. That's the safest place to be. And she comes with tears, literally drenching his feet with tears. What do you think she was crying over here? The gossip that was going about around about her? No. Why was she mourning? Because of her sin. Because of the sin that she had been committing. She's mourning her sin. This attitude and this approach is exactly what Jesus is preaching in this beatitude this morning. This is the evidence of regeneration. Such a broken, contrite, mournful spirit over sin is evidence, is an outward working of an inward spirit of God. This is clear. This is an evidence of a blessed person, according to Jesus. The church in America is in a stat, sad state when most preachers get congregants that look for flaws like Simon does in your text here in Luke, rather than people that come to them like the woman weeping over sin. I was talking to a, a pastor yesterday, and he was so heavily burdened, and I really understood it. So much criticism pastors are getting these days. He said, man, I just got to figure out how to keep it quiet in my head so that I can do my job and I can preach the word without letting these people get in my head and not allow me to do the work of God. We got a lot of Simons, not a lot of these blessed women. We need more of these blessed women. But listen, most people don't cry over personal sin because they're not battling it. They're not battling it. They don't hate it. They have never seen it for what it is. Let me show you something I think I don't know of any more beautiful example of what sin is than what John Piper said. Let me show you what John Piper said that sin is. John Piper, Dr. Piper says, Sin is, and listen to this, the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not revered, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted, the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, and the person of God not loved. That all still lives in you and I right now. So let me ask you, how does not that not daily break you? How does that not break you? How can you love God and that not break you? Let me tell you something, church. If you can't get broken over sin, wherever you're watching this from, or in a church parking lot, it will never break you at a, in a pew. It'll never do it. Because pews do not make converts. John chapter 16, verse 8. The very one who comforts, that you can see in that text, is the very one who convicts of sin. The gospel of mourning by the Spirit should be something that comes spontaneously and freely to us, not anything that somebody forces us into. And it should be spiritual. We should mourn more over sin than suffering. We need to examine ourselves and see if this is true for us this morning. The Holy Spirit isn't just the person that just pokes, just pokes at the heart. He's not just some weakling poking at the heart. The Holy Spirit pierces with the sword and drives straight through to slay the old man and he puts to death the old nature of sin and he cuts off lying tongues and he breaks proud knees right at the joint and he smashes idols of wood, clay, and brick. The Holy Spirit is a mighty person and a warrior. In our mourning with him, we find comfort. In that mourning... With him, we find peace as it's extended to us, and we come into the peace of God. The Pharisee and the prostitute, one washed Jesus' feet, and if you look at that text later, I encourage you to do that in your own time, one didn't wash his feet at all. One mourned their sin, one exalted themselves. One was worldly and outwardly religious, and the other one was outwardly and openly, admittedly sinful. One argued, one adored. Which one are you this morning? There is no in-between here. <clears throat> the morning, crying, sinful prostitute left in peace, comforted, and forgiven. You see that at the end. Christ says, go in peace. The happy, comfortable, religious, hypocrite Simon was under wrath. And may still be under wrath 
right now if he never repented. The Holy Spirit is even called the paraclete in Scripture. It's called the comforter. He is the one that comforts. The one that convicts is the one that comforts us. We are convicted so that we may be comforted. Every child of God, listen to me, every child of God, if you're a child of God, under the eyes where your tears have just streamed out over this sin, there's blood smeared on your face from the very hand of God wiping those tears away. You have a blood smeared under your eyes from wiping the tears away from your face. That blood came at the price of sin, by the hand of sin, for sin. Now, how can these marks under our eyes of comfort not turn into a warrior's paint against sin? How could these marks of comfort not turn into a war paint on our face with the blood of our, our beloved Christ against sin to battle like a mighty warrior with the Spirit of God? It should. That's exactly what it should do. Our comfort is not only in the forgiveness of sin, but also in the daily defeating of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, Godly sorrow produces what? What does it produce? Repentance. It produces repentance. You will never, ever, ever repent of a sin you do not mourn. That is step one. We must mourn. If the Holy Spirit never pierces you through and never causes you to mourn, you'll never know the peace of God. It will never be known to you. Listen, comfort is not the goal. The, the fleshly man or woman wants to read verse 4 here in Matthew 5, and we want to say, oh, blessed are they that mourn. <laughs> For they shall be comforted. Oh, comfort, 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 comfort. Listen, comfort is not the goal. Comfort is the promise. It's not the goal, though. Godly sorrow and repentance leading unto salvation is the goal. That's the goal of the text. That's the goal of the verse. Do you possess such tears? Do you have them? Have you ever shed them? Do you possess such hurt, such scarring? If you don't, you know. You can't cause it. You've sat here and listened to this the whole time, and you've thought, what can I do? I've, I've never been able to do that. I don't know how to get it. You can't cause it. You know that. Go back to first base. Remember? Verse 3 is first base. We have to touch this base before going any further. Go back to first base. Go back to beatitude number 1. Ask God to break you. Beg at the feet of God until you're broken. Find the Spirit of God and fall upon that sword that it slays you and pierces you straight through. Parents, do you see godly sorrow like this in your children? Grandparents, do you see this in your grandchildren? <clears throat> Church, do you see godly sorrow like this in your congregation? At this time especially. Christian, are you trying to put death to sin? Are you mourning over it? Does it even matter to you? Does it even matter? Do you even care? These are questions that must be asked and answered by this text. The text stands in front of us. The words of Christ stand boldly in front of us today. And it makes us answer this. The sin that, if this sin doesn't end until we're glorified, then so too our mourning against it should continue, even today, even in, as we continue in the kingdom. So beloved, let me tell you in closing, let me admonish you to let your comfort, let your mourning find comfort in Christ, in His spiritual wealth, in His sacrifice. Your sins, like mine, they may stack high, but let me tell you something. Mount Calvary stands higher this morning than your sins. Mount Calvary is higher up. Your sins may be cold and dead, but the blood of Christ is warm and living, and it is still fresh this morning for fresh sins this morning. You come and drown them in the pools of blood at the foot of the cross. Find comfort in His promise and in His resurrection. The bride of poverty, which we were marrying into Christ, will find wealth in her groom. Praise God. He counts and collects every one of these tears of mourning. They are as precious as myrrh. They are blessed tears of the righteous, and they mint diamonds in our eyes. For the saints, indeed, sin does cause mourning, and it should. And Christ, he will cause you comfort. Great comfort. Bring your mourning to him. The comfortable this morning, as in the time of Jesus, the comfortable need afflicting, and the afflicted need comforting. Christ extends himself in this way still. 
Come to Christ. Hide away in Him. Like David's harp, He will soothe you in trouble. His staff is steady and His way is right. You know, Psalms 23 even. Your staff and your rod comfort me. Come. Come to Him. Come to the shepherd afflicted sheep. Come to the shepherd of comfort and care. Come to Him. He still extends a friendly invitation to you this morning. Here, at the feet of the shepherd, the law is going to find rest. And wrath is put away for grace. And comfort will always eternally abound in Him. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You for producing a holy morning in us, Your people. We thank You for crushing us against sin. Lord, we thank You for breaking us and our pride and our ego and our comfort and our love of sin. Lord, You've caused us to be a new people with new passions. Lord, if there's anybody within a shout of my voice that does not know mourning over sin, that does not see sin rightly, that does not feel correctly about it and still loves it, and hates you and your righteousness. Lord, break that person. Send your sharp spirit and its sword to drive through them. Lord, we pray your spirit work powerfully in people, that they would slay old people and bring to life new beings with new affections and new desires. Lord, you are mighty to do this. We know this because you have done it for us. We didn't simply get just smart one day or just become moral or righteous. Lord, we had an encounter with you our living God, and we pray this for others in a mighty way this morning that they may know this and experience this. Lord, cause those dry eyes to cry and weep and be broke over sin. And Lord, pull them to you. Comfort them. Comfort them in a way that only you can, that a minister can't and a spouse can't, but only of the mighty living God who has reigned, conquered life, death, and hell and sin can comfort. Lord, we pray this. And we ask this humbly in your holy name. Amen.